Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Caleb Zachran, Assistant Editor of the New Books Network. Today I'm speaking with Wendell Ni Lai Ajiti, Assistant Professor of Post Reconstruction U.S. and African Diaspora History at McGill University and William Dawson Chair. We are discussing his recently published book, Cross Border Cosmopolitans. The Making of a Pan-African North America, from UNC Press. Cross-Border Cosmopolitans examines the evolution and influences of Pan-African thought in the 20th century. Deeply researched and carefully written, Cross-Border Cosmopolitans is an undeniable achievement. Wendell, thank you for joining me today on the New Books Network. My pleasure, Caleb. Thank you for having me. Of course. You know, th- this was a great book. We were, you know, we were just talking before about how, uh, so, you know, some of the other other interesting work that's been done recently on uh, cross-border issues, looking at the at the U.S. Canada border as just this fascinating uh, site, and uh, you know, before jumping into the book and talking about about all the things that you that you write about, I was wondering if you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, my my pleasure. So my name is Wendell Ninlai Ajiti. Uh, to my kinsmen and my kinswomen on the African continent, and also uh, throughout the African diaspora. I'm also known as Ni Lai Usabu, the first Atrikoi Ublantai Manche. My background and connections to this particular uh, discipline and history and subfield. Um, so for starters, uh, I was born in a, a part of West Africa that was literally, my ancestors called it the, the belly of the beast, um, which should signify the 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 sheer horror, the instability, um, the mayhem over the course of four hundred years of of transatlantic slavery and, and what they endured and resisted, um, and truly what they had to overcome. Um, and so, growing up, coming from this part of the world, um, before immigrating to Canada um, as a child, and then you know moving to the United States, where I spent seven years in graduate school. Um, have really shaped my my sensibilities as a historian of the United States uh, and certainly a historian of the of the African diaspora. And for this particular book, can you talk about how the idea first came into being? Was there a particular text, archive, or conversation that sparked the idea? A little bit of both, um, or all of the above. So, for starters, I worked in youth gang intervention um, before pursuing my, my PhD. So in North Toronto, um, some housing projects in North Toronto. And I was working among friends, peers, um, some family members. And one thing was very certain, uh, especially for anyone who's seen inner city, you know, America um, up close in person is that the types of social disorganization, especially gang activity, um, homicides, violence, uh, the recidivism, et cetera, is very racialized. It's very gendered. Um, and so it was a similar dynamic in, in North Toronto and other parts of the city. Uh, mostly young black men, uh, gang banging, uh, slinging dope, going to jail, coming back out, trying to gain some type of foothold and, and uh, in society, and so I was asking the elders, why is it that almost every other community uh, that has immigrated to Canada, and, and Black folk are an exception, um, that you know, wow, the vast majority in North America are not immigrants, in fact, they are the only involuntary immigrants. But why is it that um, other communities have been able to gain a semblance of social mobility, and economic, and political power? Um, and our community is dealing with so many challenges. Uh, and so these were the types of questions I was asking that weren't necessarily historical in nature, maybe more sociological. Um, and so I, I went to pursue my, my PhD in the United States, but it was over the course of my doctorate that I, you know, un- uncovered just this this incredible and intricate um, web of, of um, Black people, uh, self-making and, and, you know, identifying with sort of a global community to resist forms of white domination, um, how they were crossing the U.S.-Canadian border. Um, and certainly uh, it was over the course of this research that I would find sort of a uh, an unequivocal definitive answer to my um, ruminations, to my questions about why so many of our sons were getting warehoused, um, dropping out of life, and i.e. being killed in the streets, et cetera. Um, that these were uh, the direct 
policies of state counterinsurgency uh, against forms of black power and, and pan-Africanism. And I can say a little bit more about that later. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, you talk, you really cover so much in this book. You look at, at basically, you know, a hundred years, even more, honestly, uh, worth of history because you, you talk about so much. Um, and, and the book starts, uh, by looking at sort of the, uh, some of the origins of, of Pan-Africanism. But before looking at the origins, I was wondering, you know, to someone that's never heard of the concept of Pan-Africanism before, uh, if you could explain a little bit, and obviously like, you know, as, as we'll talk about, there's so many, there's different versions of Pan-Africanism, but just at the most basic level, how would you explain it? At the most rudimentary level, Pan-Africanism is the unity of African peoples. The unity of African peoples to overcome forms of anti-Black racism, anti-Black exploitation, anti-Black domination, um, unity, and the the process of uh, self-determination, whether in the African diaspora, i.e. like North America, South America, um, and points beyond, or on the African continent. And chapter one looks at at the origins of North American Pan Africanisms uh, and the impact of the of the post World War One era. And I was wondering if you could just describe uh, this period and, and some of the characters that you examine. Sure. So I start the chapter chapter one um, in 1919 specifically. In 1919, the world was in the sort of in the wake, the ashes, smoldering ashes of, of the Great War, this unprecedented sort of a global conflict. But the world in the United States was a blaze. It was a fire, principally because of racial strife, uh, white mobs terrorizing black communities and even black servicemen, black soldiers who were returning from Europe wearing their, you know, military uniform, having stripes for distinguished service. Um, against German uh, forces on the Western Front. And these were individuals would be uh, lynched on military uh, uh, installations or on streetcars, trams, etc. And so there were over 60 uh, quote-unquote race riots. And these were actual sort of, you know, low-level race wars in, in urban America from Washington, D.C. to um, Chicago um, and well, all types of uh, communities across uh, the United States. And it was within this sort of social and racial milieu that for the first time truly that we see black folk, um, African-Americans not turning the other cheek, not engaging in this sort of, this this very problematic notion of Christianity of turning the other cheek and not defending oneself. But this was a moment where they fought back and they resisted and they resisted in this almost revol with revolutionary fervor, right? Uh, and this resistance that we saw throughout quote unquote Red Summer or 1919 uh, was in many ways had been uh, several years in the making um, and several years in the making in terms of a, sort of a, a, a more crystallized understanding of, of Pan-Africanism and what it meant for black people to unite and unify their, their strength and so when I, I talk about the, the genesis of, of Pan-Africanism, um, especially in, in the 20th century, um, I actually go back to like the ancient ancient world, um, antiquity, where African peoples, not just based on what black people were able to uncover in the historical archive, but what white writers, observers, academics, philosophers, Greek, et cetera, Assyrian, what, what have you, um, had had uncovered in the in the historical archive and documents that they had left behind um, that black people were never in fact um, those who were holders of wood and drawers of water, meaning they were never just merely a servile class, right? Which was the caricature in, in, in the Americas, but that black peoples were the first civilizers, right? From whom civilization actually came um, and would, you know, in many ways cross-pollinate with what we see on in sort of Southern and, and Western Europe in terms of the Greco-Roman um, powers and, and elements of, of the Levant and, and um, the Mediterranean uh, basin. And so this uh, influence of Nilotic Africans and, and just their sheer greatness, their contributions to arts and science, et cetera, 
really inspired black men and women who were literally a generation, sometimes they were born in slavery or a generation or two out of slavery, right? And so I, I sort of look at elements of what was happening in terms of race science and technology in the 19th century. Um, and this the scholarship that was animating sort of black activism, black self-making, black self-assertion, black self-determination, um, this scholarship was clearly pointed towards one particular direction, which was restoration of the race. And to restore the race meant you had to uncover the history of the race. To uncover the history of the race meant that you went back to a time when black people understood the power of, of, uh, of racial unity and, and, and self-respect almost. And so Pan-Africanism would crystallize within this, this social milieu, although not exclusively. You, you refer to uh, this, I'm not sure if this is your coinage or someone else's, but as a messianic moment. Um, and, I, and I was wondering, you know, what is meant by that by that phrase? Sure. So the, the messianic moment is a phrase that I coined um, principally because I wanted to illustrate that circa 1919 to like the Great Depression, 1929, 1930, 1931, there were seismic events happening in the world. Right, this was the era of, of sort of global self determination of subject peoples aspiring to lead themselves, whether they were Irish, whether they were European, Eastern European Jews, whether they were um, people on the Indian subcontinent, whether they were Muslims or, or Arabs, uh, whether they were Far East people like Japanese people, Chinese people, Koreans, etc. And African peoples were very much part of this sort of global renaissance of people asserting their rights to lead themselves out of colonialism or forms of colonialism and, and subjugation. And so the messianic moment was a, was a moment where uh, various ethno-racial peoples anointed their own to lead them, right? So it wasn't about having sort of um, appointed um, colonial administrators, but it was sort of an organic, from the bottom up, uh, revolutionary struggle of people appointing their own to lead them. And so the Messianic moment um, looks at the ways that African peoples anointed their own leaders, and principally the most significant leader of that moment, and even just over the course of the 20th century, was a Jamaican immigrant by the, by the name of Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And I argue, and I'm arguing in that book, but also in, in another book project, that Garvey was unequivocally the most profound sort of revolutionary messianic leader um, of the 20th century. Um, and even more so that it was Garvey's messianic uh, revolutionary leadership that would influence the Bureau of Investigation in more ways than one and influence sort of the entire U.S. national security apparatus about the quote-unquote threats or dangers of black men in particular, and this is very gendered, black men who were ethical, black men who couldn't be bought, black men who wouldn't cower or kowtow to white domination, black men who were entirely committed to the liberation of black men, women, and children. What were some of the uh, the specificities of Garveyism uh, that made it... Uh, particular uh, to, to Garvey, you know, that Gar basically Garvey's view is compared to other Pan-Africans, Pan-Africanisms that were uh, uh, around at the time. Uh, and, and why did Garvey, why has Garvey really become just this, such a crucial figure, him versus others? Was he charismatic? Was he, you know, what what qualities did he have? Garvey had many qualities. Um, absolutely, he was charismatic. He had a gift for gab. Garvey was a, a son of the soil, a son of the African soil. He was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. Um, he didn't receive much formal education like, you know, other black luminaries like Du Bois, et cetera, et cetera. So Garvey often said that he came up from the, the hard knocks, right? Um, and unlike Du Bois and other black elites, Garvey understood the Negro masses. He understood the black masses in intimate ways because he was of that class, right? Notwithstanding being born in Jamaica, but he arrives in the United States on the 23rd of March, 1916, right? And he would change the course of human history um, via 
uh, his sort of global program called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. And Garvey created this global movement based on uh, the principles of Pan-Africanism, but revolutionary Pan-Africanism. Um, and what made Garvey especially unique and distinct in this moment and just in the course of human history is that he predicated his movement on the notion that black people must restore pride of self, right? So when we think about black power and black is beautiful, all these things that would resurface in the 1960s and 70s, this is because of a Jamaican immigrant who arrived in, the, in New York City in, in 1916, but who was so beloved by the African-American masses, right? So notwithstanding sort of the ethnic cleavage there, but the Negro masses in the United States loved Garvey. They revered him like he was he was a godhead in so many ways. Um, not that he was above reproach or anything, but because he did something that no one had ever, ever done, probably in the history of the Atlantic world, right? As historians or some observers of the day tell us, Garvey instilled love of self in ordinary people who had been beaten to dust, right? Uh, black women who were working as um, domestic workers, uh, black men who worked as railway porters and did all types of other menial jobs, Jim Crow, you know, racially terrorized, brutalized, disenfranchised, um, dehumanized. Garvey was the first person to tell them that you are beautiful, your kinky hair, your ebony skin, your broad nose, your full lips, your African features. These are beautiful things because clearly if we are made this way, then our creator, meaning God, must look like us in some way. So then God must be black. And I mean, like this, it was just so unconventional, right? It was so nonlinear in terms of how the Negro leadership, the talented tent, like the boys who was one of his uh, chief rival, it was just so different than how they went about quote unquote race work or uplift, right? Garvey was just unapologetic. He was gritty. He was pugnacious. Um, he had, you know, his, his, his quirks, uh, without a doubt, um, but his authenticity and his vision was unparalleled. And to make the UNIA, uh, that much more of, a, a formidable organizing body, Garvey instituted something that historians often call black capitalism, which is patently false because it illustrates that they haven't either um, scrutinize the primary sources and the archives closely, or they haven't analyzed the primary primary sources in good faith. There was nothing about it that said black capitalism. Garvey said, and Garveyism um, advocated or propagated the idea that black people should own their own businesses, their own institutions, but not in the vein of capitalism, because capitalism is a system of exploitation pr predicated on sort of three pillars, right? Land, labor, capital, especially in the hands of of private owners or shareholders, a few shareholders. Instead, Garvey said, let us build our institutions. Let us have black businesses, factories, our own presses, um, industry, and a shipping line, the Black Star uh, Steamship Corporation line. But this is what makes it truly different and truly unique and revolutionary. The masses, the Negro masses will own these black enterprises. No one of the day not, not even communists of the day and the socialists were that audacious. But this man, this Jamaican immigrant, right, who didn't have the fancy Harvard PhD that the boys had, um, or Columbia or Yale pedigree, Garvey said, let the Negro masses own the means of production. So I argue my book and I point out very clearly that what Garvey was engaging in had nothing to do with capitalism. Garvey wanted the masses to own the means of production. In fact, what Garvey was doing, we could call it appropriately, race-first revolutionary socialism. So Garvey wanted to harness the power of the global African community to build institutions, harness the resources of African lands, African labor, to build institutions, have an African army, a United States of Africa, right? Which, of course, would bring them the crosshairs of the U.S. national security elite. Um, harness those resources to build an African army, Arfic African navy, African diplomatic corps, and protect black people at home and abroad, as you would say. So in Africa, 
and in the Americas. And so Garveyism was unlike anything that the black world had ever seen before or after. You, uh, you, you mentioned Garvey was, you know, from Jamaica, came to the United States. Uh, and so much of this book is, is about how, you know, about Pan-Africanism beyond just the United States. Um, and oftentimes like, you know, I'm an, I'm an American. That's how I feel like in school, it's typically taught us. It's just to focus on America. You know, you learn, you only you learn about, a, you know, a couple of, uh, a couple of names like Du Bois, person that you mentioned, uh, and then Garvey. Um, but you, you also look at at, at Pan Africanism in Canada too. Uh, you know, especially in, from the periods of 1930 uh, to 1950 is kind of bubbling up. So I was wondering if you talk about uh, what that looked like and just the broader uh, Pan African sentiment on the on the uh, the continent. Mm-hmm. So Pan Africanism um, it was very active in, in in the United States and Canada because. Black people in the United States and Canada were very much integrated. They were an integrated people. Um, and frankly, a lot of the Black population in Canada were either descendants of slavery in the United States, so families that came up during the Underground Railroad um, in the antebellum period, or like when you go far east in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, et cetera, the uh, Maritimes uh, provinces, um, those Black families there and Black communities there were relocated as a result of the U.S. Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, right? And so this idea of um, an African North America is is not sort of uh, something that I, I'm imagining or placing, foisting on on uh, my historical actors, but they very much embody this. And so the Pan-Africanism that we see um, is very much uh, part and parcel of the integration of those two peoples uh, in Canada, the United States, and certainly peoples who are coming from the Caribbean. And so Garvey, for example, um, visited Montreal, where I'm, I'm, I'm currently based, in the winter of 1917, right? So first time he came here, he gave a speech that electrified the masses um, and, and got people thinking in very concrete ways about race first or, or pan, pan-Africanism. A year later, Garvey's here again and gives another lecture. And Unbeknownst to him, there's a, a young woman who had just arrived from Grenada, and she would meet an African American man who came from Georgia, right? And they would go on to have like more than a dozen, or pardon me, half a dozen children, about seven or so children. Uh, one of whom is named Malcolm, right? And Malcolm would very much grow up in the vein of his parents and Garvey, and I'm referring to Malcolm X. And so, uh, Pan Africanism in, in, in the United States and Canada is a, a very sort of real integrative phenomenon. Just to share uh, one really quick uh, tidbit with you, uh, I start, well, do I start my sort of historiographical analysis in the 19th century looking at um, the the literature on on ethnography, both white and sort of black people's ruminations and scholarship on ethnography. Um, I start the book in 1900, and principally because there was a, a Trinidadian immigrant, brilliant Trinidadian immigrant named uh, Henry uh, Sylvester Williams, who who comes from uh, the island, immigrates to the United States and New York City in particular around like 1895 there, or in early 1890s. And a couple of years later, because he just couldn't find work and couldn't get into school for lack of resources. He crosses the border into Canada, and in Canada, he is trying to make ends meet, and I think working as like a, a, a railway porter, ends up in Nova Scotia. Um, and long story short, uh, Sylvester Williams will go on to become uh, the person who like coins that phrase of Pan-Africanism. But his time in, in, from Trinidad to the United States to Canada, and then he crossed the Atlantic to the UK where the first Pan-African conference would take place in 1900, uh, it was very influential. In fact, it was the black community in Nova Scotia uh, that would provide him with a a basis of sorts to think about what a global African community meant, right, in terms of resistance against imperialism um, and and colonialism. And so what we see over the course of the 20th century and into the 1920s, the 30s, the 40s, and to the 50s of black people coming together, working together, is very much built on a legacy of, of predecessors who understood that there was only one way to overcome white domination, and that was unity of African peoples. 
Uh, chapter three, you you move ahead looking for, at the period of 1950 to 1967, uh, and you, you track a little bit of the sort of the the, uh, the divergence uh, between America and Canada in its view towards the, the Black struggle, and maybe some some awakening in the in Canadian society uh, divergence, wanting to push back on on the colonial uh, colonial history um, that the United States was still. Uh, you know, deeply embracing. And I was wondering if you'd talk about this chapter a little bit uh, and just the relationship between civil rights, uh, the call for civil rights, and then just the broader struggle for human rights in the post-World War II era. Indeed. Um, So chapter three, yes, civil rights or human rights. In the post-World War II period, with the rise of the civil rights movement, of course, African-American intellectuals and activists realized that civil rights was, in essence, empty rhetoric. It, it lacked substance because it was more of a nationalist project predicated on the whims or the quote-unquote goodwill of U.S. politicians, half of whom, of course, were in the land of Dixie, right, who didn't want Negroes to have social or social rights and civil rights, etc., even more built with you rights. And so... The phenomenon in Canada was actually different because as the United States and Black people pursued sort of this project of civil rights, um, Black people in Canada pursued a project of of human rights. And this is, of course, more than just sort of surface level rhetoric. There's substance to human rights because civil rights, as I noted, is is a nationalist project, right? Um, States, sovereign states. Uh, bestow civil rights upon citizens, whereas human rights are more or less about sort of natural rights, sort of the um, uh, God-given rights. Uh, in, in the post-war period, post-1948, with the U- UN uh, Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, um, the, which you know the United States rejected, even though Eleanor Roosevelt was like the chair lady, um, Canada very much embraced that multilateral institution and multilateral ethic of human rights. The U.S. could afford to reject it. Canada couldn't. And so in the post-war period, Canada always feeling as if it was in the shadow of a, a very big and powerful and arrogant brother, big brother, um, needed to do something to distinguish itself, right? To sort of um, flaunt its own um, soft power. And so Canada embraced human rights, um, which black activists advocated for and pushed. And in fact, I I talk about an African-American gentleman, a veteran of World War II, named Daniel Grafton Hill III, who comes from a a, a Maryland family. Um, He was married to a white American woman, but they relocate to Canada in the the early 50s to escape McCarthyism. But Daniel Hill and and his wife, Donna Hill, um, were very much instrumental in terms of institutionalizing and building um, the human rights uh, sort of uh, infrastructure in Canadian society, along with other Black activists, um, Jewish activists, uh, Asian uh, Canadian activists, um, et cetera. And so we see towards the end of Malcolm, before sort of the end of Malcolm X's life, um, Malcolm critiques this this framework of civil rights and says that. And I I quote him in the book, uh, Malcolm says, you know, when you're asking for civil rights, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're basically asking your oppressor, Uncle Sam, to give you something, which you know Uncle Sam is not going to do because Uncle Sam doesn't ever have a history of doing that. And he says, we must take our beef, our issue to the world core, which is the United Nations. Uh, And this was a tactical move because Malcolm uh, understood, based on sort of the Canadian experience and other sort of jurisdictions, that to win certain concessions, you need to bring the eyes of the world um, in a jurisdiction or in a, in a sort of institution where there were other global players, right? So in the, in the Cold War politics, with Cold War politics um, and anxieties over, you know, uh, East versus West, human rights uh, made it very difficult, especially for a country like Canada, uh, to continue racist practices against Black people, um, Jews, Indigenous peoples, uh, Asian peoples, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so Malcolm was using some of these examples to say, hey, we need to go to the world court. You know, I want to I talk a little bit about the period following civil rights 
um, and this the sort of the rise of, of the Black Power movement. Uh, and I was wondering if you talk about Black Power movement, especially uh, with Vietnam going on, uh, and just the relationship between Black Power uh, and Pan Africanism. Indeed, um, excellent question. Uh, so Vietnam, Black Power, or Pan Africanism? The Vietnam War had a very profound impact, not only on just U.S. society, but also on, on Black politics. And so as many um, military-aged white men, young men, and their girlfriends or spouses are exploring ways to resist the draft, um, protest in U.S. Uh, militarism or imperialism, um, they look northward, right? And they, they immigrate to Canada. Um, and in fact, in their periodicals, and this is fascinating as I was going through the archives, you have white men from all parts of the United States resisting the draft, and they are documenting their resistance of U.S. imperialism almost verbatim in ways that Black people talked about slavery in the 19th century. And in fact, over and over, the first time it happened, I was like, this must have been a typo, but then it kept happening. I'm like, okay, this is a very deliberate act of resistance. But they kept referring to their migration north, to Can uh, different parts of Canada, as their journey on the Underground Railroad. And I'm thinking something really powerful is happening here. And so, of course, um, there were Black resistors as well, right, who resisted the, the military draft, absconded from draft boards from like Mississippi or or Louisiana to California to uh, Wisconsin, et cetera, and ended up in Canada and in Toronto. And of course, they're arriving with very sort of militant ideas about Black power. Some of them had been former Panthers or they remain Panthers. Um, and certainly they had been part of sort of the, the Black uh, militancy, Black liberation movement of the six, late 60s and, and 70s. And so they arrive in Canadian society and they're interfacing with African Americans other African Americans, other African Canadians, or, or um, African Caribbean immigrants um, from coast to coast, but principally in, in like Nova Scotia, Ontario, um, and Quebec. And these ideas of Black power and, and Pan Africanism, of course, um, are very complementary. Um, in fact, you know, Black power comes out of a notion of, of, of uh, Pan Africanism. Um, but we see elements of, of Black power that was formerly more parochial, sort of nationalist, just to the United States, becoming very globally minded. And in terms of some of these global um, sentiments, um, we see African peoples, uh, in terms of their organizing efforts, their activism, their advocacy, uh, their cross-border, sort of transatlantic connections, uh, they're thinking about sort of reviving what Garvey had done in the 1920s. And so this is a moment in the late, six, late 60s, early 70s, that they are having these very real conversations that, you know, this is the moment to strike uh, because the U.S. military uh, and imperial machinery is distracted in so many ways. And so we need to articulate um, what... Uh, anti-colonialism means, what decolonization means, uh, what liberation in Africa means, uh, what resistance to neocolonialism means as well. And so these politics are pro playing out across sort of North America proper as I articulate in, in terms of the United States, Canada, the Caribbean Basin, but also uh, some transatlantic connections on the African continent. So, you know, as uh, as you, you discussed before, Canada's uh, attempts to portray itself as a as a a, a better place uh, for Black people than the United States, uh, you know, n not just soon after in the in the in the sixties, um, the U.S. Uh, U.S. and Canada would cooperate in their attempts to stop uh, these these Pan African uh, and Black Power movements. Uh, and Chapter Five, the Mind of the State, I think this is really just such a a, a fascinating chapter. We talk about. Uh, Warren Hart, an African American operative for the the FBI, uh, and attempts to infiltrate the Black Panther Party. And I was wondering if you just t tell the story a little bit of of Chapter Five, uh, because I really think it's something that that listeners will find find fascinating. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I might have fallen into depression after researching and writing that chapter. And as I noted uh, to you, Caleb, and to your listeners, part of the reason why I pursued a PhD was because of what I had personally seen and experienced in terms of um, uh, my my friends, um, some a good number of whom came up in the streets, caught up in gangs. Um, I mean, something that we were very much aware of and and you know something that impacted us and to varying degrees starting on in high school and so researching chapter five and of course coming across this name warren hart right and i had heard elders mention this name vaguely but people didn't really want to talk about it you know it's like one of those horrible things that the community wants to forget and certain certain elders who interacted with them want to forget and so I couldn't have written this chapter if I didn't, you know, apply and petition for certain FOIA documents, right? So national security records, uh, military records, et cetera, in the United States, but also in Canada. And so Warren Hart, uh, for your, your readers and my editors at UNC have told me not to give about too much detail when I'm, I'm talking about certain things in the book to encourage you to go by the book. Um, but I'll provide a little bit of sort of high level detail for, for your audience. Warren Hart was an African American born in, in North Carolina in the 1920s, late 1920s, I believe. And he came of age, of course, at a time and place where black folk were just always catching hell. And, and so Warren Hart enlisted in the, in the U.S. Navy. Um, served overseas, I believe, in, in, the, in the Far East and in, in Asia. Um, when he was discharged from the military, he tried to join the U.S. sort of federal civil service. Uh, long story short, he had a hard time sort of finding economic security. But Warren Hart, unlike other black people who had a hard time um, achieving economic security, was just ruthless. He was just a he had a very mercenary mindset about the world, right? He had zero race dignity or love um, or loyalty, um, and he would do whatever it took to make a dollar, make a fast dollar. And so it's it's fascinating how his life actually ends when you get to the conclusion of the book. But nonetheless, uh, Warren Hart, because of his military background, um, he understood that if he could get additional sort of training and like military intelligence, et cetera, that might facilitate some opportunities for him within the federal public service. He does just that. MLK is assassinated on April 4th, 68. The United States goes up in flames, I mean, across the country, Baltimore in particular, like a thousand businesses are destroyed. Um, it's just outright mayhem. And so the National Guard in, in Maryland, uh, where Warren Hart, uh, worked as as a reserve member, um, the FBI approached the National Guard and recruited Warren Hart to masquerade as a Black Power militant. He does that. Um, at the time, the FBI, um, through COINTELPRO, was recruiting various Black people, men and women, business owners, etc., across the country, inner city communities, to infiltrate the Panther Party. So the Panthers were thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly infiltrated. And a lot of the sort of bad things attributed to the Panthers, whether it's quote-unquote violence um, and other forms of, of disruption, et cetera, weren't actually Panthers. They were, they were spooks, government agents. So Warren Hart becomes a government agent. He's working, um, he's masquerading as a Black Power militant. So the FBI tapped him to establish the Baltimore chapter of the Black Panther Party. And he does just that in the autumn, circa October 1968, unbeknownst to everybody, like that this guy's a federal spook. So he's recruiting members, recruiting members. Um, but people be became suspicious because he's always trying to entice them, encourage them to engage in criminal and unlawful activity. And they're thinking, wait a minute, we want political education, right? We want to build our institutions. We want to resist the fascist tendencies of the police, right? And the imperialistic tendencies of, of our institutions here in, in Maryland. 
but one heart had zero interest for that. So he's always goading these young men in particular, young brothers, you know, go commit a robbery here, go do this, go raise money so I could send it to Oakland to the headquarters, all BS. And some of these young men will get killed and, and, and the robbery's gone wrong, right? And so long story short, Warren Hart is outed as a, as a spook. He goes underground. The feds protect him. They hide him. You know, they're monitoring phone calls um, to ensure that nothing happens to him. Eventually, because Canada and the United States were so tight at this time, um, especially on the issue of Pan-Africanism, or at least resisting Black power and Pan-Africanism across the border, the feds in the U.S. and the feds here negotiate to bring him here uh, to Canada. And he is deputized to basically infiltrate infiltrate and undermine the black community, um, create bad will, uh, and also, you know, do whatever it takes to disrupt uh, red power and black power because of the American Indian movement had learned a lot from black power and they had become very militant across the United States and into Canada. And so black power and red power were building some really meaningful uh, interracial coalitions and one heart was tasked with destroying that movement as well. Uh, but in terms of the anecdote I share with you about sort of gang gang activity and gang violence, one of the significant takeaways from this book, uh, and I never anticipated this until I, I saw the classified uh, materials, is that it was far more expedient, and I'll repeat this, it was far more expedient for the U.S. federal government, i.e. the U.S. national security apparatus, and even its equivalent much smaller sort of equivalent in Canada, far more expedient to have black communities where the men and the boys in particular engaged in that type of gunplay, murdered one another, trafficking drugs, not building institutions, uh, not having any hope, going in and out of prison or being just warehoused in jails and prisons. Um, and we know this without a shadow of a doubt because part of one of the mandates, one of the one of the five mandates of Comtel Pro was to prevent black youth and again boys and men from aspiring to revolutionary Pan Africanism, black power. And this was J. Edgar Hoover. He said, "Negro boys who want to become revolutionaries will be dead boys. They'll be dead men." Right. So whatever it takes, make sure that they don't have black youth do not have a semblance of love for self and race and community. And so what Warren Hart did was he would um, groom black young men or teenagers in, in Baltimore to engage in criminal activity. Um, he would, And when he arrived in Toronto, he was tasked with doing the same thing, groom teenage boys to engage in criminal activity. He would give them straps, firearms, pardon the street vernacular, give them firearms, handguns, um, that he was given to him by the Canadian National Security Apparatus, right, because he's an undercover agent. So he would give them these guns. He would teach them about police evasion tactics, um, how to rob, you know, establishments, et cetera. He would draw the robbery plot, uh, plot. And he would commission these boys to commit very serious felonies and then turn around, tell the Toronto police and the, the national security, the RCMP, which is equivalent of the FBI, that, hey, this is what these boys did. I've, you know, I've solved the crime. And he would get promotion, raises, et cetera. Um, but it would criminalize these boys and it would have a ripple effect because they would all end up, you know, as like 16 year old, 17 year olds going to jail and then getting sent out uh, doing pen time, like hard time in the joint. And so I, I uncovered that through this process of, of counter subversion, it was actually uh, counter insurgency that these boys and young men had been marked for death. They were deemed enemy combatants, not because they were waging war against the United States or Canada but because they had sort of a Garveyite, revolutionary Pan-African mentality or mindset uh, to resist white supremacy. And so uh, the, the issues around gang violence comes into play because when these males are young men and, and boys are incriminated and criminalized in this particular way, um, over the passage of time and with, of course, the flooding of these communities with all types of narcotics, et cetera, uh, and the ease with which they were incarcerated, um, uh, the communities became socially disorganized. Gang violence became sort of a fact of life, um, and as opposed to community organizing, which is what Panthers were trying to do, Garveyites were trying to do. And so this is, I argue, uh, 
uh, an unspoken of counterinsurgency that we that took place in the sixties and seventies in Canada and the United States. Right, and then that it in uh, in chapter six you you expanded even further. It's it's sort of similar looking at the theme of of the way that you know the United States in particular and Canada uh, too, but particularly the United States tried to suppress Black Power, uh, not just in North America. Uh, or in Canada and uh, the United States, but also in the Caribbean and, and in Southern Africa. Um, and, you know, uh, I was wondering if there's anything, any, anything from, from that chapter that you'd want to add to, um, it's, it's also just uh, like seeing Warren Hart still, uh, involved in this, in this project, just the, the sheer, uh, influence that he had in these movements yeah. is pretty remarkable. Yes. Um, Certainly, the sheer influence is longevity in terms of serving as an agent of counterinsurgency uh, for the U.S. national security apparatus, uh, for the Canadian uh, government as well. Um, in Chapter Six, uh, Cold War, Cold Wars, Hot Wars. Uh, so, in, in in short, I won't go on too long. Um, the entity in, in Langley, Virginia, and I think your your readers, or pardon me, readers and, and your listeners will know of that entity, that infamous uh, entity in Langley, Virginia, traced the coordinates of revolutionary pan-Africanism and black power in the 60s and 70s. And the coordinates, it was literally a, sort of an Atlantic triangle, right? So if you think of Canada and the United States constituting one node of a triangle or a vertex, the Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean constituting another node and Southern Africa in particular, so like South Africa, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, um, Angola, et cetera, constituting the third node or vertex of the triangle, where Black activists um, are sharing ideas, they're sharing resources, they're sending soldiers to fight you know, Portuguese uh, imperialism and colonialism and, and Mozambique and, and uh, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, et cetera. Um, so what happened was that, uh, the entity in, in Langley, Virginia, uh, traced those coordinates, um, and as a result sent very sophisticated weaponry, like very serious hardware, uh, that a U.S. Canadian corporation weapons manufacturer, right. Um, was, uh, was, uh, uh, manufacturing. So they sent them from the United States and Canada to the Eastern Caribbean, to these parts of Southern Africa and, and, and the African continent. Um, and as a result, they were able to strike uh, what seemingly appears to be a death blow to this Black Power Revolutionary Pan-African um, uh, uh, movement. And of course, as you said, Warren Hart is, is playing a role all along. He's there acting as a hired gun, tearing, I was going to use an expletive, tearing SH. Asterix, dude, you can curse on this. You can curse. Uh, <laughs> Tear shit up. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know how many how many kids are listening. And if so, I'm sure that they know what that means. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, you know, my my last question related to the book. Obviously, you know, you you cover you cover so much in this book. Um, but you know, so so hopefully, listeners, you know, having started just with with a, a basic def definition of Pan Africanism. You know, the thing that, that I was really uh, thinking about so much, and this just even goes to the title um, that you use, Cross-Border Cosmopolitans, um, is, you, you know, we hear, hear, you know, there's there's so much work and a lot of scholarship done, and you talk a lot about Black nationalism, um, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about uh, the relationship between cosmopolitanism and nationalism, because people oftentimes put cosmopolitanism um, on one side of, uh, of the spectrum and nationalism on the other, um, and with your focus on on cosmopolitanism, what what you, you felt in, in this project you were you were trying to get at with uh, looking at a more cosmopolitan approach as opposed to a nationalist oriented approach? Right. So the, yeah, this is a really excellent question. Um, very, it's a really thoughtful provocation. I don't know if I could do it justice in the time remaining, um, but I, I wanted to create that kind of tension for the reader, right? As, as you point out, sort of this perceived um, hybridity or, or, or dichotomy of between cosmopolitanism and nationalism. So black nationalism, there are elements of black nationalism that can be the sort of inward looking parochial, um, but then there's an element of, of 
black and nationalism within pan-Africanism, which is very much outwardly local, outwardly looking and global in its scope, right? Um, and so pan-Africanism is inherently sort of global. It's inherently sort of um, uh, border crossing. It is cosmopolitan. And, you know, I, I think about cosmopolitanism uh, within sort of racial, a racial context of, of the African world, the black world. Um, in the in the 19th century, George Washington Williams, for some of your readers or and your your audience who might know that name, he's like the reputed father of African American history. Wrote like the first sort of monograph on the African American past in uh, circa 1890 thereabouts. He was also the same person. He was traveling in, in the Congo and saw what was happening, the genocide of King Leopold's Congo. He told the world about it, right? So he's a reason why like people know about it. And so George Washington Williams in his in his you know groundbreaking book on the African American past from like 1619 to like the 19th century, he said, and and I quote, Africans t- since antiquity have been a cosmopolitan people, right? And so what does he mean by this? So he's he's saying something that is sort of a fact of life. Like African societies, African states and empires. Inhabitants, the residents, the subjects, they were very multilingual, right? They were very uh, multicultural. They had religious systems that were highly syncretic and hybrid, right? Um, there were sort of sophisticated trade networks that, were, that would ensure elements of cross-pollination, right? And so people were very much worldly, not, and, you know, to disrupt sort of caricature images that one might have of, of uh, ancient Africa or Africa uh, during transatlantic slavery. And so in the night in the 20th century, it's very much clear like I'm looking at the, at the sources and the archives and you had black doctors in like Toronto who again, you can imagine like you know a black doctor. So somebody who's like super well to do, right based on certain class dynamics is very like elite and is expected to behave in a particular bourgeois way. but at a, at a, at a meeting, uh, of this black organization that would become a Garvey chapter, the first Garvey chapter in Toronto in 1919, December 1919, he brings up the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. And he says, hey, no one is going to help us. Look at the ways that the Japanese are organizing. Look at the ways that Jewish Canadians are organizing and the Chinese are organizing and the East Indians and the Ukrainians and the Poles, the Italians. He says, no one is going to help us, right? We must help ourselves. And in fact, and he take and this is where he really like blows it out of the water. He's like, we must be like the Bolsheviks, right? We must be that militant in demanding our justice. And if militancy calls for it, we must be that militant in demanding our justice, just like the Bolsheviks. And I thought, this is actually very peculiar because it disrupts all these notions of, of especially class dynamics and even how we might imagine black people um, to have been behaving and thinking in the early 20th century. Um, but it speaks to the the, the power of uh, just this idea that black folk were never just local actors. They might be local actors, but they were always globally minded, right? They were always thinking about what's happening around the world. How are subject peoples navigating forms of imperialism and, and you know, ruling class politics, et cetera, et cetera. And so the cosmopolitanism that I invoke um, speaks to something that um, other scholars, uh, especially of, of sort of um, African-American or, or African history have appreciated that, you know, black the black experience is inherently cosmopolitan. The nationalist element uh, speaks of the, the notion of building institutions right? Institution building, right? And ownership of those institutions, um, but not nationalism. That means we're cut off from like what's happening. We're not sophisticated in terms of engaging and forging connections and linkages. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a really useful explanation. Cause that was something that I was, you know, I was wondering like, what's the, you know, what, what's the, what, what's the relationship and what, what are you getting at by that? That, that makes, that makes quite a bit of sense. Um, well, uh, Wendell, thank you so much for, for being a guest on, on the new books network. Um, the book is Cross Border Cosmopolitans: The Making of a Pan African North America from UNC Press. I, I highly recommend people uh, go uh, go and pick it up. Thank you. My pleasure.